Today's topic will be the Kibana DevTools. Um, so we'll dive into that a little bit and into the different functions it offers. So let me share my screen, set it to full screen, and here we go. So what we will do today is that we will take or not take a look at the analytics, enterprise search, observability, and security part, but we will take a look at the management dev tools. And if you're a Kibana user, you might not even need to use this, but if you are an Elasticsearch Power user, it's very probably probable that you've already seen this kind of tools. So let's take a look at the dev tools. So there are four different dev tools at the top, and the one which I personally use most is definitely the console. And the console is, if you would be mean, a very simple JSON editor, which allows you to define an endpoint that you want to send a HTTP request to, but it actually is much more. And in order to understand this, let's take a quick look. The first thing that you specify is always the HTTP verb, and you see already now, without me having typed a lot of things, that there is one major feature to this uh, console, and that is the auto-completion. Like, this console knows pretty much all the endpoints of Elasticsearch, so it's really easy to uh, find a certain endpoint that you're interested in, for example, the cat indices endpoint. Um, if you don't know, the cat API is kind of a human-readable API and easy to pass that is not JSON. It's basically returning a, a TSV value, tab separated value with all kinds of information unless you specify it to be JSON, like in this example. You already saw now that I sent a request without actually using my mouse and hitting this little button over here. The reason is that there's a certain set of keyboard shortcuts. Um, and if you're interested in those, uh, you can basically just open up the help and you see the keyboard commands over here. So that's not all. Um, I could. Uh, search for something like in the Kibana task manager index if you want and hit the search endpoint you can see you can auto complete over here but there's even more you can auto complete within a search request so I could specify a query uh, could run a match all query and just return all my documents within that index um, but I could also do a little more like specifying a range query and then I could specify the task scheduled add. And you see here, for all my feeds, I have uh, fields, I have an auto completion. So you don't really need to know which fields are within your index. Like Kibara is smart enough to look this up for you. So we could specify it's a it's a day field. So we could probably just specify now over here, see if there's anything coming back. And we see a total of 11 documents being returned within the Kibana task manager index. Um, we could also do some reformatting. So in case you've worked up your JSON formatting, all you need to do is to hit Command E and you get some formatting. You can also hit it twice and you get everything in a single row. Uh, that might be easier for copy and pasting. That might also be easier for um, creating a bulk request when you use the, the bulk API in there. And yeah, there's a couple of other nice features. Um, like making it easier to write scripts in here by using the so-called triple uh, triple text notation. Uh, but as we do not have so much time, I would rather cover the other tabs up there because I think they're actually known and used much less than the DevTools console that you're probably already aware of. The first thing here is the search profiler. Um, the search profiler is a tool within Elasticsearch to figure out how long a query actually took. Um, it's an argument within every search request that you can add, but this one is a little nicer because by adding a request over here, we can run the profile API and you have a nice UI because the JSON output of this uh, tends to be rather massive. And if you had different queries running up here, you would see how much time is spent per query. So this is a rather small index. This also explains why the query time is rather quick. Um, you could open up the different kinds of queries here and see like what query exactly has caused the higher amount of time that it needs to be executed in case you find a query uh, that is slow with execution. Uh, you can also go even further deeper and use the details over here, but that probably requires some more Lucene knowledge of what those terms actually stand for uh, in order to make sense of that. But this is usually just already a good indication if you have several queries, like a, a Boolean query with should, must, and filter clauses uh, where your time is actually spent. And the same also applies to aggregations. You see here I added another aggregation for the task type. 
uh, and here you can also see further details which part of your aggregation took the most time. Again, uh, all of this was rather fast because the index is small. Um, the moment you run into performance problems, this is usually a good start to just get a very coarse overview uh, and then take a look at your queries from there on. So the next thing we want to take a look at is the Grok debugger. Um, you may know Grok from Logstash as well as from Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch has a Grok processor, which allows you to split the field into several values based on regular expressions. And Grok is basically a library of pre-existing regular expressions. Um, so what we could do with this is if we have a log line, and let's take a classic Java application as an example, which every Java application comes with different log file formats um, because it's easy to configure within the, the log4j tooling. Uh, we could now try and extract the timestamp over here the log level, the Java class, the host name, and this at the end is basically the full message. So what we could do now is we start slowly with a grok pattern like this one, and then we could just use, I think it's greedy data, and run the simulate endpoint. So we just started to extract the first field, which is a timestamp based on the ISO 8601 standard, uh, which also allows for comma here in case you're wondering. This is usually a dot, but again, this depends on the implementation, and the rest is just discarded. And so now you can work step by step through adding every single parameter here. For example, I would probably like to add a log level over here as my next step. So this would look like this. Uh, we have a word here, a single term, we have a log level, and we also have a space in this uh, concrete example. Uh, however, that space might not always exist, right? If we have a log level of trace, this is usually not filled up. So uh, the space is implicitly optional in our example over here, how it's added. And we could now go through this step by step, but I will take a shortcut for the other fields and we can just take a look at that. Um, the last part here would be the, the Java class that is used. Uh, then there's a space actually in this logging format. Then we have the host name and another space, whereas all the previous fields did not contain one. This is all the fun with logging. Um, so in our example, we can just extract this and go on. And without having to create a simulate pipeline request, without having to create a logstash configuration, you can use this to basically narrow down your Grok expression before putting it somewhere else. Uh, and this usually just uh, makes the turnaround of writing your Grok expression much, much faster. Um, you can also add custom patterns if you need to, um, uh, but by default, you will have all of those available that is, are also available within the Elasticsearch uh, Grok processor. So the last part is the painless lab, uh, and that is probably the least known one. Uh, you may know that painless is our scripting language. Um, and what we can basically do over here is we can write fancy smileys, but that's not the whole idea. Um, the interesting part of this painless lab is that it has some kind of auto-completion for our scripting language and usually makes it much easier um, to get used for the scripting language. Um, so let's come up with an example. And we will have a filter context probably uh, where we also come up with a sample document. Let's have a sample document like this, which contains a bytes in and a bytes out field. Um, also, I think we need to create an index for this in order to have it to work. So let's quickly do that. Uh, let's name it test. Go back to the, to the lab over here, use the test index, and see that we have a bytes in and bytes out field. And imagine we would like to filter on the bytes total field. Right now, there's uh, no script, but we could just come up with one um, where we calculate if the bytes in and bytes out field is greater than 2,000, uh, 10,000, we would like to return success. If we take a look at the context, we have two fields here, 5K and 6K that are more than 10K. We could just update this to 1K and would see that the output is false. And again, it's much easier here within the painless labs to write your script instead of resending a request every time. Um, and of course, we could have also solved this by using a runtime field today. But in order to just come up with a short example, I used the bytes in and bytes out field. The other solution to this might be to re just re-index uh, your data or have an ingest processor that creates a bytes total field. 
Okay, that's that. Uh, this was the quick rundown through the different tabs within the dev tools. I'm sure you know the console, uh, but don't forget about the other tools, especially the search profiler in, in times of um, yeah, search, search issues when there's a, a slow search, uh, as well as the Grok debugger if you start using uh, Grok more heavily. All right, thank you. This was the today's introduction. And next week, we will take care of some more advanced topics um, on the one hand on the UI side, but we will also take a look at things like uh, Vega and Lens. So if you're interested in more advanced visualizations, just tune in and have a nice weekend today. See you.